So thank you, everybody. My name is Kristen, and um, as Brooke mentioned, I am a principal for Christian. I've also been training. I know you guys um, heard from Ian last week. Um, I'm a student of Ian, so he got me in. Totally excited at the story of the internship, and actually part of my story is I was a social worker before I became a teacher. So when I got into his class at the book when I was in school, it was like, what was it called? Like, this is blending the nutrition piece with the social work piece, and I don't know, okay, it just felt like that missing. And I've now seen that in action in a practice You know, it's like, you wonder why people have great social media changes? It's the relationship piece. Very, very clear. So, um, so I work to blend the nutrition component alongside that relationship component. So we can make nutrition changes people want to, and keep that on, right? And not have any judgment. You know, I'm not a nutritionist. <laughs> it's like, oh, you can't have sugar. We're going to take those foods away. <laughs> so, so, you know, the world of experience and sometimes I'm Maybe I'm doing work with other nutritionists and dietitians on the business and learning and just approaching it in a very different way. So I do a lot of one on homework. I also teach classes um, and I'm also doing a physician's course, um, like an online course right now. For people. I do a variety of different things, but here um, today I'm here to talk to you guys about fast. And I call it happy fast um, because I mean, we can call it, some people will say healthy fast. And in that, in that, in that idea about the relationship and a food story, um, naming things like good or bad, healthy is kind of kind of healthy enough. So I kind of just call them happy facts. Because there's, there's all different kinds of that. We need all of them um, in our life. So I kind of want to start out by knowing what you guys already know about that. What have you heard? What do you know? Maybe what's the question? I've heard that all fats are better than low fat things because they're the synthetic and then body doesn't process it. Okay, so um, just, to, just to repeat that so that. Um, a, a full fat or a full fat item is better than a low fat item. I would probably get straight less processing for sure there. Anything else for that? Do we need them? Yeah. Why do we need them? It's part of the question. And we don't think anybody knows about passion, right? It's love. I remember that when I asked people about it. Yes, it is. That's actually one of the key components, right? And I mean, it's, it's so thriving for kind of still in this the, the low, the low fat teaching that happened quite a long time ago. It's still actually present in, in a lot of people's minds and a lot of doctors' offices, things like that. And yeah, when you're missing fats, you miss out on, on your fat soluble vitamins because you need the fat to help absorb those vitamins. And your fat soluble vitamins um, are vitamins A, D, E, and K. So I'll write those here. So, yes, we, if you are taking a vitamin D supplement, because we live in Oregon and we don't get sun, you want to take your vitamin D supplement with food and with food that contains them. Okay? So it's A, D, E, and K. Those are your fat soluble vitamins. One of the biggest, biggest reasons why we need our fat. Okay? And if you're somebody that struggles with taking your vitamin D with food, one of the tips I always say is grab a food one. You know, you can have a whole meal, but that butter is a nice good fat. And why else do we need that? Energy. Energy, yes. They do give us energy. And what kind, we know a little bit more about what kind of energy they give us. Is it your first source of energy for your body? No. No, it's actually the last class, well, second class. So you're, you're going to work for your energy. You're going to go fast for your energy. So yeah, you produce energy, it's a, it's a longer, like slower energy. It's not your quick energy. And your carbs are like quick energy. That's super vital. What else? Yes. 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 Yeah, so it keeps you full. It's tasty. I'll throw that in there. Ooh. Yeah. Because that, I mean, that's important. Our food is supposed to taste, and we have to eat to live. We might as well enjoy it when we do it. So feeling, feeling full and how the food tastes. So it enhances the flavor of our food. When you pull back that food, it usually don't taste very good. And kind of going back to that. Whole fat versus not fat piece, when they're pulling fats out, they're adding something back in to make up that loss of taste. Okay? So you might as well go with the whole fat, kind of how nature intended for you. That's, you know, that's how it's to be enjoyed. Why else do we need that? Don't worry, they're pretty important. Okay. Those neurons. Yes. So those neurons. The neurons are like, you can use neurons in your brain that are sending all the signals to your nerve cells, your body, so forth. But beyond neurons, I'm missing beyond neurons, it's just every single cell in your body. So your cellular health 
it's important. Every single cell is made up of fat. Um, they're all surrounded by a layer of fat. Um, your neurons require fat. Fat also helps all that nerve conduction happening, so it's important for your brain health. You have all of your cells in it. If you think about your, your cells are all encapsulated, basically with fat all the way around them. And that's how your cells control what goes in the house. So we need that in right? And your body knows you're generating cells. So if your body's generating trying to make new cells and it doesn't have fat put around protection for those cells, it's probably going to be a problem. So yeah, we definitely need in there. Anything else you guys can think of? Is it per per yeah, preferred fuel source for your heart? Okay, that's, that's one that not everybody knows about because they're like, oh wait, we're supposed to like, watch our fats for our heart health, right? It's what your, it's what your heart actually wants to, wants to use uh, for its energy, its fuel source. It's, it's, it's preferred for your heart. Okay, so fats are actually important for us. Um, any other reasons? How about organ protection? Okay, we've got we've got fat captured in all the organs, especially our internal organs. And you do hear a lot of talk about this one fat being bad. And there's the different types of fat that you have, like within your stomach, but also just anywhere else. That fat is actually valid for the fat that you need. So if you had no fat in your abdomen, there's a lot of stuff stuffed in there, and any impact is going to cause organ damage. Okay, so you need you need some fat um, around your body, especially all those great organs. If you want some fat around your liver. Your liver doesn't love Okay? All in like your fish bleed, your blood source. You want even a little bit of fat fat in your mouth. So fat, fat, fat can be protection um, for us as well. So any questions about that? Does that make sense for everybody? Kind of why we need so pretty so pretty important. We don't we don't really want to be um, pulling fats out of our diet, okay? So um, in terms of Actually, I'll, I'll say one thing about the heart before I move on. Um, you, see, you see a lot of heart recommendations, and it, it actually does come from the American Heart Association, to have a lot of polyunsaturated fats. We're going to go into what that is in a minute. Um, you know, versus saturated fats for the heart. There actually is a lack of research backing on it. There have actually been recommendations sent to ignore that, that, you know, pushing a lot of vegetable oils is actually not really where you need it. So it's kind of an example of where our research doesn't always. Get translated into the recommendation that it takes a long time for recommendations to place to change. And another example of that is why there's still a lot of people that think of no fat in it. So the thing about it, but just so you know that yeah, there isn't there's not the research backing on how bad fat is happening. So the high fat fats play a role, play a role, just like all of us. There's only high cholesterol is not too much fat in your arteries. So that's that's kind of like a misnomer on that today, not kind of helpful, but also helps go there. So cholesterol in your body is like the cholesterol in your food. So the so seventy five percent of the cholesterol in your body is actually produced by your body. Only twenty five percent is dietary. Okay, so your um, your dietary your dietary cholesterol absorption is very very well controlled by your body. And there's one exception to that, and that's if you have uh, I don't know if the genetic um, um, mutation is on that. But there is a very small percentage of people, and if you if you assess into that, you won't know that on your heart. Like, it will be a bit more than you need to watch out for cholesterol. Um, that's a very it's a very different one. So cholesterol in food is very different than cholesterol in the body. So eggs being high cholesterol, and the whole like egg egg whites over egg yolks, the whole egg. <laughs> so the nature gave you the eggs as a whole egg. That cholesterol is actually super important for making. And all your hormones start from cholesterol. So in your body, you'll use all the fat that you're taking in to kind of create some that external cholesterol, but it's also going to use for your dietary cholesterol. But usually when you're when you're overeating dietary cholesterol, you're actually excreting it. So your body controls it. When you go past that 25% and your body's like, we've got enough, you excrete it out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. So we'll go over that part. So we'll, we'll, we'll go over the types of fats here. Um, for you, so you've got some like a little graph on your paper, you can follow along here. So, um, I'll kind of try and get it all in here for you. So, we've got our fats. We've got two basic types. So, over here, we're going to talk about saturated fats. Okay, these are the ones that have kind of been yellowized a little bit. Okay, and I'm just going to kind of encourage you to not be so afraid of saturated fats. 
Um, and also, before I go through all of this, everything that contains fat is actually okay. So you're going to see that we're going to put butter in saturated fat. Butter has polyunsaturated fat. Okay, everything really is a blend. So we're I'm kind of categorizing it as more the majority. So it's kind of that you're getting a blend basically in everything. So your saturated fats are going to be your your solid at room temperature. Okay, and they're going to be more more um, stable and less um, likely to oxidize. Um, so think about solid at room temperature. So what what kind of fats are solid at room temperature? Because I give I give you one butter. What else do we have? Coconut oil. Coconut oil is kind of a kind of a different one in there. It, it does have that's what we put it in there. It's one of those that will start to get running with these. Mm -hmm. Butter will see what coconut oil will do it sooner. Mm -hmm. But coconut oil does the most sweet well here. It, it it's got some mono in it too. So we can we can play we can play with that one. Grease? Is that a fat? Yes. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have Or yeah, we'll most of kind of move into animal fats. But like if you run like a tallow or lard. Um, you can look at baking grease, baking grease, all of that there. What else do we have for saturated? Anything? If we're looking, if we're thinking about a kind of a food, avocados are going to contain some saturated. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We could put all those here. All those are a pretty even blend of fat, like kind of hard to categorize, but you'll sometimes see them. Okay. Yeah, so your saturated fats, the things to remember about them is they're more stable um, at room temperature and they're going to be less likely to go bad on the way because they're, because they're stable and they're solid. Okay, so solid and they're more stable. So then we're going to go over here and we're going to go to polyunsaturated. And these are just like the chemical terms. Um, for how, how, how they're defined, you don't really have to know that. These are often referred to as HUFA, if you ever hear that word. That's kind of the abbreviation of polyunsaturated fat. Okay, so that's where they're at. And then polyunsaturated, so these are your ones that are going to be liquid. Okay, and they're going to be a little less safe. And, we're, and then these also get divided into two different categories here. Um, so I'm going to probably run out of room. A little bit sloppy there. So your polyunsaturated is going to get divided here into your mono. Here. Oh, sorry, I actually had this wrong. So this is mono. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is where my brain is always all the So we're first going to do the gel with the mono unsaturated comes before this. Sorry. And mono gets it up. And mono goes to poly. And we can just go ahead and fill some. The poly one, you make you have omega six. I'm gonna go first. So I'm gonna go a little bit out of order, but we're gonna talk about all of this so that you guys. Okay, so mono one saturated versus my turn. Mono one saturated versus your saturated. We've got the liquid at room temperature. Um, what comes to mind when you think about mono saturated fats? Those are often ones you sometimes we'll get we'll get a little bit more. Of them. So if I said what's a heart healthy oil, what would come to mind? Olive oil. Yes. <laughs> so we'll put we'll put olive oil here. And yes, the mono unsaturated are ones that your heart your heart prefers. Okay. So um, olive oil is definitely one there. Um, you can put avocado in here too. Avocado has lots of mono unsaturated. Yeah. So we'll put we'll add avo to our list. There's so avocado or avocado oil uh, are both going to go in there. And actually, um, one one um, exception to your animal fats is chicken fat actually has a very large percentage of mono unsaturated. So it's your one animal fat that kind of falls over here. Put that there. And those are those are your main mono unsaturated fats. Okay. So then we're then we're going into the the polyunsaturated. These are your least stable that we're kind of going down the continuum of stability for your oils. Your polyunsaturated are going to do that. Now, your omega 6s are the ones that are usually more common when you think about and we tend to use more often. But your omega 6 ones tend to be pro inflammatory. Now, inflammation is not always bad. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. 
and your omega threes are anti-inflammatory. Okay, so that's kind of how these two get split. Now, the important thing between the omega six and omega threes is that it's your ratio, it's the balance. How many do you do? If you're eating a lot of omega sixes and hardly any omega threes, then that ratio is going to be off, and you're going to have probably a little bit more pro-inflammatory than those. If you're balanced in those, you're probably not going to have a problem. So it's not that you need to avoid these if they're pro inflammatory. Because when you have an injury, you want to have inflammatory markers in your body ready to go, right? So you need some of these omega sixes there that are going to support that inflammatory response. Does that make sense? So it's your balance. And what happens for the typical American diet um, is that we get too many omega sixes and not enough omega sixes. If the omega sixes are already available, then this is kind of where, when you like look at the recommendations on heart health, for example, talks about polyunsaturated fats are very good. They're anti-inflammatory. Yes, they are, but we gotta start thinking about a lot. Okay, because you'll see vegetable oils as a recommendation, and your vegetable oils fall under your omega six <clears throat> Okay, so these are your these are your vegetable oils. This is your canola, your corn. Okay. And then your omega 3s, the biggest source here is going to come from fish. Okay? You can also get these from, get from flax seeds, um, chia, chia seeds, walnuts. There's some other sources of your omega 3s, but your biggest source is fish. So that's one of the areas where we get that kind of imbalance. We, we don't tend to eat a lot of fish um, in our diet anymore. I mean, it's definitely kind of changing a little bit for a lot of people, but. That's kind of been, we, we tended towards more land animals <laughs> instead of for fish. So omega-3, that's, that's where we get our omega-3s. Um, we just need things. What about um, sesame oil? Uh, yeah, so that, those are going to be, those are going to be when you're in, in the more than blended category. So they're, they're going to they're gonna fall down here as a combo and not really be like highly weighted on either area. Yeah. So those, I mean, those are going to go like with a huge, Huge volume of oils and like look at all of our value acid profiles. But these are going to be your main ones. They're going to be high on either side of this category. And you said we want to eat a blend of both. You do, and, but usually it's easy for us to get your omega sixes in. It's usually not easy to get omega threes in. So here's one of the things I'll put down. It's usually a little bit controversial and might cause some questions. Is your omega sixes? There are going to be also be some animal fats that are coming from our conventionally raised animals. Okay, and these are, and then you're gonna get omega-3 fat actually in grass-fed. Okay, so have you all heard red meat's terrible for you, right? <laughs> Not as grass-fed. And it's actually plasma tested. So the key is it's really getting omega-3s out of meat. This can just be 100% grass-fed. Because of course, our food industry is kind of messed up a little bit. Of the topic, but um, you know, once grass fed beef kind of caught on, and the study came out about the health of the grass fed beef, people want to go to the But it's expensive to do grass fed beef. And you actually want grass fed pasture raised. Because if they're grass fed and fine, they're still going to be, your, what's happening is your animals are making it. If animals are fed in the inflammatory size, they're going to be inflammatory that you're eating. So that inflammation is going to be in the muscle that you're eating. If, they're, if their diet is their normal diet, they're not going to be inflamed. So that's where you get the, the um, anti-inflammatory oils from the animals that are raised as they're intended, eating grass, stop and mushroom. Does that make sense there? Okay. All right. Um, and dividing these things, is there a clock that's coming over there? Okay, I just want to, make, I just want to watch my time. So I, I can tend to like, talk on these for a long time and go over. <laughs> yeah. Is it the same for fish that are <laughs> mass on? Yes. Yeah, your farm raised fish are going to actually, yeah. Um, if you ever want to like kind of dive into that, there are, yes, there, there are species that would, I would, with fish, I would definitely recommend wild caught. And if you're buying fish oil, um, I would recommend looking, looking for wild caught fish oil, like an Alaskan fish oil, and also your smaller fish, so your mackerel, your sardines, your anchovies. So they're going to be bigger ones there, but no, not bigger because they're smaller fish. Um, <laughs> But they're they're going to be more concentrated, and they're going to be you know the better ones for you. And we and if you're drinking fish oil, store it in your fridge. 
And she'll talk about storage and then for all, your, all of your oils when we talk about oxidation of oils. Uh, yeah, so just kind of think about your own diet. Like, you know, where might it be differently balanced in this? Um, and you'll, you'll find that when you're buying um, processed foods or pre made foods, so maybe you're buying something from the deli and they're making a salad, they're probably going to use canola oil. You're going to a restaurant, they're probably using canola oil. Or you make the same thing at home, you're probably using all of them. So just knowing that then, you know, those choices can affect which fats are going in and kind of where you might be on that spectrum between omega-3 and omega-6. Now with these, so do we have any vegetarians or vegans in the room? Okay. So you can get so your omega-3, your plant-based sources here. You guys, you guys may already be aware of this. Um, there is a difference between what fatty acids you're getting out of that. So with your fish, you're getting what's called down EPA and DHA. Big long names. You'll see those like on a bottle with your buying fish oil, like how much EPA and DHA is contained. You actually want to make sure it has a large percentage of EPA and DHA. Those are the fatty acids that you want to get. Now your your plant based, so your flax seeds, your walnut, chia, and seeds, they have what's called ALA. And ALA has to go through more conversion than it competes with any of the omega 6s, but down a conversion ratio, and so you don't convert it as efficiently. Okay, you can get some omega 3s from algae sources. So that's another place for um, making the vegetarians to get it from, but there's no, there's no way that there's a little less efficient conversion, and so being aware of that, there might even be a higher. Just be aware of that. Okay, one other fat that's not on here. Does anybody know what it might be? Okay. Yes. Trans fats. Okay. So trans fat, so I am, I am, like I said, I'm not the nutrition, this is not the eating thing, this is my one section. Okay? Trans fats are ones that I really do encourage people to really reduce and eliminate their diet. And that's because we have some more studies that show that these are. And that's also why there's a new weight learning requirement for trans fats. So I don't know if you noticed, it was probably about maybe four years ago? I'm not quite sure. The weight learning requirements changed for trans fat. And so you'll see product labels that say zero grams trans fat. However, they can say zero grams trans fat, 0.5 grams or less of sodium. So it's actually not zero grams trans fat. So once again, all the marketing that our companies are allowed to do. So just be aware of trans fat. So you're mostly going to find them um, like in chips and prepared baked goods. So like if you're buying, if you're buying cookies or a cake, you know from. Like a grocery store deli, that kind of thing. Um, or you're buying shelf stable muffins that don't that you consider an encounter for a month without <laughs> moving. But trans fats are probably going to be on the end So the things to look for um, on that is well, first of all, don't don't buy a label when it says zero gram trans fat because they can they can still have Okay. So you're gonna you're gonna read, you're gonna read. But what I suggest people do if you want to read labels is you look you is you ignore all the calories. Fat by ignore all that. Go to that ingredient list, and if on the ingredient list you're seeing partially hydrogenated oils, that's your trans fat. Okay, but partially hydrogenated oils. Right now, that's not right now. Because they're not in these really good. <laughs> and basically, trans fats, the reason why they're an issue for your body um, is because they're lab created. So they're made to be shelf. So there's there's kinks that are in fats, and they've been unkinked to be like, chemically unkinked, forced to be unkinked to be real. And so what happens is you find them in them, or torn, they've been it's been manipulated, and they've been manipulated to create shelf stability because it, you know there's there's a lot less food waste they can make they can make they can make kinky little things go to forever. <clears throat> that kind of thing. So, any any questions there? Do like tropical oils really fit in that category? Uh, tropical oil? Yeah, like palm oil or um, palm is actually on the saturated side uh, over here. So yeah, so that, that one's that one is the issue more with palm oil is more it's sourcing and environmental issues with palm oil. So but yeah, but, but palm oil is not no, it's not human So like is it margarine or like so they're like the earth balance kind of stuff now, I grew up on like where it's vegetable, but I mean, they, it's like super adulterated, right? So then, like, what about like the other kind of like the like, is it still in that channel? I mean, I have to go, I have to go look at the, yeah, yeah. always. That's how they're making it, I can't that's how they're making it last. But yeah, you are, you 
you are getting you are getting a lot of canola oil usually that vegetable oil in that um, but you also are getting the trace um, and short yeah. is the short is going to have um, yeah. such a trace so your your best uh, go or go back trips go back to the basics go back to the original we used to not have something we've always had we've always had we've always had we've had we've had we've had we've had we've had we've had palette um so you know versus you know our our created trying to because really when if you're thinking about where margarine came from and all that it came from trying to reduce that for us we just created what kind of that was so yeah go for the real stuff go for that go for the grass stuff there. Okay. All right. We already covered cholesterol. So, any any questions so far on all of those? Is there any tracer in here? No. Okay. I can grab you a towel. There's also okay. the back of the board too. I cover this next part without it. Do you want to see the back of the board? Is it is anything that's not around? Yeah. It's not a deal. Look at that. Okay. Okay. You got to yell at all of them. And she's like, oh, it's all gone. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, oxidation and smoke point um, of your oils. Okay, so, anybody know what oxidation is and what it means and why I'm here about it for our oils? Do you guys know what LDL is in your body? Is that the bad cholesterol or the good cholesterol? LDL is your quote unquote bad cholesterol. HDL is your good cholesterol. They're both cholesterol. Okay, what do you mean? Um, your LDL is oxidized fat. Okay, your meal, all of that is oxidized fat in your body. This is what that means is that oxygen is broken. Okay, but if you want to think about oxidized fat or fats that we can't use, they're not they're not a usable fat for our body. It's gonna help help us when we talk about like, oh, why we want that. Oxidized fats are actually harmful. And they're very hard to buy. Okay. However, we make them all the time. So you, you take in like all the LP side of fats that we have, your body's gonna naturally produce oxidized oil. So like actually it's not actually gonna produce oxidized fat. It just happens, but then what, what, what's cool is that your body has a natural way to deal with that, which is the HDL. So as long as you have good HDL, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be able to clear out the HDL actually goes around all your blood vessels and goes down to scatter those cells. And okay, this is how wonderful your body is. They're made to deal with all those things. The problem is, if we then to make oxidized oils, we've added that load. Or also, I should say oxidized fat, not oxidized oils. We're adding the load the body has to deal with. Now, we may need to deal with its own load, but not necessarily an increased dietary intake load. It's not the level of So that's why thinking about oxidized oils are not our Okay? So, oxidized, so, sorry, I keep saying once. An oxidized fat is one that is basically gone from the best thing you can Okay, you guys have all kind of grabbed a bag of nuts probably and you know it's a bad thing. <laughs> that on my back for you, then you open a can of oil and you're like, so hot. Okay, that's a rancid oil. That, that oil, that nut is not to us. Okay, so I suggest when that happens, throw it out. It is not worth the money that we Okay. So if anything smells off, smells or tastes off, pops it. Oops, and I can't spell. Okay, so like kind of rely on your taste buds, rely on your nose, oxidized oils and fats. We just we just don't want. Okay, so to help prevent oxidation, what you think causes oxidation is heat and air and hot. Okay, so you think about these are all things that are going to contribute to oxidation. So when you buy nuts, I suggest you store them in the fridge. Because okay, your nuts are a blend of all the oils that come back. And so you have, you have some stable oils in your nuts and you have some unstable oils. Throw them in your fridge or in your freezer. They're gonna last a lot longer. Maybe, maybe keep out, if you don't like eating cold nuts, <laughs> keep out what you might eat in you know, a week. But store the rest in the fridge. Especially flax oil. So for you guys, if you're having flax oil or flax seed, by whole, by the whole, I would actually say by whole flax seed, and then grind it yourself in small amounts that you're going to use within a week or two. Because flax oil, or flax seed especially, as soon as it's ground processed, it degrades and breaks down and oxygen is really good. How, do you, do you know how fast? I don't know, I don't know how fast, but it's all going to depend on how, like, what's going on. Like, 
Is it on the counter or in your house for a summer? Say I've had it in the freezer for like maybe five or six months. <laughs> like hypothetically. Okay. Cool. And then in the ones I ground up and they go in the fridge. So like projection date hypothetically would then matter too, right? Wait, sorry, like, like, date on yeah. It may or may not, right? Because so let's say um yeah, I've ordered more online, right? Then there'll be more I got a grocery alley, yeah. right? And there's something that's coming out. That's already not, right? It's yeah. probably sitting on a hot truck somewhere, or another sitting storage somewhere. So you don't know when those stores, how those things have been treated, mm -hmm. the time they got packaged to you. They could have been exposed to a ton of heat mm -hmm. before they get to you. So okay. they might not last to their best buy date. And flax oil, the flax oil and seeds are harder to taste than when it's gone now. So would you recommend like a certain brand or like type of like, you said fully like not unground seeds, but would you recommend any other brand or anything? Not necessarily. It's more knowing mm. because, because you can't control your whole supply chain. So like going from going to one to stores that turn over their um, inventory. Mm. Okay. okay. So that that's kind of what you want. You want a store that you see that that flax seed might be out for them. So they're turning over versus one that's always got the stock, always got plenty, and it might be sitting there for a long time. Like we just never know what, like, what's what's happening in the supply chain. Mm. And it's, those, it's the trucks, it's the transport that they're most at risk, especially in the summer. So buy them, I guess the recommendation is that they're sourced in the US, buy them in the winter. <laughs> then they got transported in cooler temperatures. And, oh, then you, and then you can pull it home. Cool. So actually I never thought that first, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so we're trying to you know, prevent <laughs> oxidation so that when you're getting oil in you, you're getting all the confidence. You're getting all those things inside of before you want that for your body, right? So you want the oil to not be outside before you get it, okay? Um, and so we're, we're trying to kind of avoid all those things that do that um, for that. Anyway, um, so when you're buying oils, here are my tips for buying. And I'll, and I'll go into small so I'll go in a minute. Is think about where that oil is sourced from, okay? So where did it come from? So let's just think, of, think about corn oil versus olive oil. Is corn something that you normally associate with fat or oily? Okay, olives. Are olives kind of oily? If you squish an olive, are you gonna, gonna get some oil on your fingers? Yes. So where so where did it actually I should, I should I should just say source? Sorry. Okay, so where did that oil come from? Could you make the oil yourself if you wanted to? Would it be pretty easy? That's gonna be Less, like, like less likely to be oxidized, it's going to be a healthier oil for you. It's going to go through less processing time. Okay? Look for it in a dark bottle. But, so then, it's so, you know, those are not covering the saturated side because those are, those are pretty stable. They, they, they get a lot more to oxidize. So these are, these are all your like mono and functional and saturated because they're less stable. They're so dark bottles. Okay? Because a, a company who's going to invest in dark bottles is kind of telling you, hopefully, that they understand this oxidation. Is a light bottle less than tons of light through all that shipping process for sitting on the shelf in the store, all of that. The dark bottles also reduce some of the heat the oil is exposed to. Okay, so um, going, going, going to those dark bottles is if it's not 100% because coconut oil, then you're not going to find that in a dark bottle. Um, it's also not, not as heated for coconut oil. So but that's just like a general, general rule of thumb. Um, and, then, and then you're kind of thinking about the types. I guess these are my like, kind of number two. It's just, Kind of take a pause for a moment when you're looking at the oil, you're choosing it, where did it come from, with an easy to extract, okay? And then kind of on your list of getting it down with all those steps, where does it fall in that, okay? So that's, gonna, that's how you're going to protect your oxidation. The other thing you're going to do to protect oxidation is your smoke points. So smoke points are important because heat oxidizes our oils. And so when we cook with our oil, which we do a lot, we use our food to cook with fat, because these are food taste good, also helps not stick to a pan, right? Um, if we want to use an appropriate oil for what we're doing. And, and that's what that means is that whatever oil we're doing is meant to withstand those temperatures. So that is not going to oxidize while we're cooking. Okay, so that's, that's why smoke points matter, because they contribute big time to this heat. Okay. Um, so the reason why you can cook on high heat with like canola oil or corn oil or vegetable oil and why restaurants use it on that already have to point. So you can keep oxidizing the heck out of it. Right? Those are already, those are kind of already gone for me. 
Um, so you just want to be aware of the point that I've created. A little chart for you. Uh, oh, I don't have a copy. So that's on the back page, has a chart for the hook points for you. So that you can kind of based on your cooking. Um, just hook points are based on direct heat. So that's, that's talking about are you are you putting that that oil directly onto that heat source, like that's that pan is turning. If you're baking, that's indirect. So you can actually go a little higher. So like if you if you're somebody who bakes with olive oil and you're seeing the olive oil at the lower smoke point, it's it's okay in your oven. Because it's not it's not getting a direct heat. Does that make sense? So you can go a little higher. This is more like if you're going to, we'll just say you're going to fry your egg in the morning. What oil would you want to use? And it's on the temperature you're going to specific that. Right? So just kind of being aware of that. Um, yeah, any questions on that? How are you supposed to know how hot it is? Um, it's a, yeah, it's a great, that's like a great question. Medium heat on a stove in general, I mean, you're not going to know for sure, it's just going to rain. Medium heat is going to be around that 350, 375. Now you're getting the high heat, you're getting the 400 above. That's just being very general. So low heat, for example, is protected for your olive oil. You're getting high heat. And I will actually have a caveat with the olive oil and heat. Um, I would say it's in general, you're safest using olive oil after the fact. Like drizzle on your salad, drizzle on your roasted veggies, use it after the fact. But there are some settings coming out, and I still haven't had a chance to dive into them yet. But it's saying the box is that the olive oil has so much good oil in it. And don't eat antioxidants, it actually protects itself from its own smoke. <laughs> now, like I said, I haven't been able to really, I, I, I haven't dug in myself to really do that research because that's the kind of key point that's valid. But just kind of know that maybe, maybe it's not such an issue for smoke. It's something to just kind of consider um, and think about with that. Uh, that's something else I'm going to say on the smoke point thing. And it's getting me right now. Yeah, anyway, so bite olive oil though is a lot of Yeah, but on your chart, like bite or find olive oil, I'm not going to order to be bite. Thank you. Um, should I ask where you were going? <laughs> it wasn't where I was going, but that's a good question. Um, so when you're processing oils, um, there's different levels of processing. So that's where you get the extra virgin olive oil. So your extra virgin olive oil is basically if you uh, first press, cold press, they're really just pressing those all out and getting the pure natural oil out. If you're getting a refined oil, they're actually sucking some of those nutrients out to make it more stable, which is why a refined olive oil has a higher strength. Does that kind of make it so? Yeah, so you're better off like the extra like stuff like eating it cold and doing salad dressing, like you don't get yeah. 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 the extra virgin. Yeah. 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 If you want to like the least processed oil, you must. So, uh, so my go point list isn't necessarily saying you don't your healthy oils to use. It's more just <laughs> either some common oils and then kind of make your because if you're okay. So I also want to say here, and I kind of didn't fall by the beginning. Sometimes we can't always afford the food that's going to be healthy for us. We have to we have to pick and choose a neutral. So if you want, I mean, common canola oil is cheap. I think it is. It's a cheaper oil to buy, much cheaper than buying a, a all extra extra virgin olive oil for a cold press in a dark box. Okay. So if you're to, if, so if, if you need to buy canola oil, you can you can help offset you know some of the some of the issues that may be happening for you oxidation wise by how you cook it and not going even you know, doing doing further damage by going above the point. Does that make sense? So that's also why some of those are on that. The other thing, and this is where I'm going from last that's triggered my brain on that thing, is that if if you, well, you can't avoid the oil and it's and it's not it's not realistic to do that, it's also good enough for you mess up your relationship to like thinking I can't have these things ever. The best way to support your body is to help your body produce the HDL. Okay, so to increase your HDL, your good cholesterol, which helps you deal with any of this oxidation that's happened over here, you eat lots of fruits and veggies. Okay, especially veggies, but fruits count in here too. You don't need to avoid fruits because they're high in sugar. Um, so lots of fruit and veggies. They eat the whole eat the rainbow thing. That's pretty good advice. They all have different nut butter nutrients in them. So eating lots of that is going to give you lots of antioxidants to help you fight the oxidation. Okay. The other thing is fiber. Fiber is included in your fruits and veggies. Also included in your grains. Okay. Carbs are good. Carbs are good. Okay. <clears throat> so these are in uh, grains. Beans, lentils, legumes, lentils, 
Um, we have some seeds. And your fruit and veggies. Okay, so this in your diet right here is going to help offset oxidation. So it doesn't mean don't order the french fries because they were fried in a oxidized oil and high heat. I mean, go ahead and enjoy the french fries. But just know that maybe, you, maybe you're going to want to have an extra large salad and not even as much. Or maybe it's a side salad. It's kind of what we do consistently. It's not one thing that's going to be a problem. Okay, so this is so, I'm giving you this about done. It's like if your body, remember, your body has these natural mechanisms to help work things out. It's just that if, if all you're eating is the oxidized oil, it's going to have a harder time. So balance it out, put a lot of this in, and then you kind of have to work on anything that looks nice. Questions. Yeah. So if one here this, here is the smoke, if you need something like certified, that kind of thing, what which one does the high heat one require that? Yeah, I usually recommend coconut oil. I think coconut oil is going to be less expensive too. That's going to be why you're more stable oil is going to be a lower cost point. Um, you also can get refined coconut oil, so it's even higher, but it's going to be fine. Um, but the refined coconut oil will have less coconut oil. Well, if that bothers you, and refining coconut oil um, is less processing than like your white refined olive oil. <laughs> so coconut oil is a great one, uh, and then uh, avocado oil is another great one. So those are those are your higher heat oils. And butter actually does butter is heated pretty good. So ghee is just clarified butter that has had the dairy solids removed from it, and so um, yeah, ghee, ghee can do pretty good at some higher heat. Um, when you suggest choosing whole fat items rather than like the low fat moments, uh, does that count for like yogurt and dairy products? Yeah, that's, good. that's usually where that's like, coming from. And that's, that's, where, that's where we see most of it now. When you see it come down the shelf, the advertising stuff is low fat, and we're seeing less and less of that. But you used to see a ton of food on the shelf that said it's low fat. It's really just they, if the fat can be moved to try and get the low fat piece, they put something up in it and it's it's usually sugar. Um, like a plain yogurt, uh, still good. Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah, cool fat. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, in general, like, if we're going to say we have, like, some loose rules about anything, it's like, you need as close to the source as you possibly can for how that food is, how that food is, so that you kind of learn how to plan it. I wish we kind of didn't have to do that, but we just, there's just been, there's so many shortcuts that are allowed in our food chain that, you know, Unless you're getting a lot of this yourself, which is really hard to do these days with all the schedules and all the demands on us and all that. Um, yeah, there's, just, there's just so much going on in the chain. So the more you can eat, closest closest to its original form. And yeah, when we did when we first made yogurt, it wasn't we didn't only fat. We just fermented the yogurt, and then gave you would ferment it for a long time, and like 24 hours in um, a little heat. That was first 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 done. But now you're not producing the food with it. Any questions? Yeah, remember these, I mean, these, are, these are just things to be considered. These are not, I, I do not want to be like, this, I don't want to be like a list of rules or a list of things you can't adapt to tax on when I'm like, oh, I know, I'm bad about all these things. It's like, kind of let this sink in and let it, let the time sink. Maybe, maybe the biggest takeaway for you is that you store your nuts in the fridge. That's, that's, that's a huge piece. You don't have to change anything else you want. The piece, or maybe the big thing you take away is that you know, increasing your fruit veggie intake so that you're helping your body work that out so that you're helping your body not fight and have those are those are actually interesting. things. So you don't have to like wipe out certain categories of food. Okay. Okay, small things can make a big difference. And diet is only one part. It's only one part, right? So you can have the perfect diet, but if you're not moving and you're highly stressed and you're not sleeping, you've got no social network or spirituality, it might not have really matter. Right? We, we've got to kind of look at all those things and then look at what's doable too. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate you guys being here tonight. And, um, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit if there's questions. Awesome. So, and if any of you, Want to continue for one on one nutrition support? I do um, either in person on the pro um, or I do virtual as well. And if you're part of our team, because there's a big council of people, I don't know how we're shooting all that. But um, mm -hmm. there's a council of guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.